So today I'm going to talk about one of the uh, new H2A products um, uh, called H2 Hydrogen Forge. This is our um, new AI engine, which is focused on deep learning tasks, first of all. Um, the session today will be focused on NLP, but I will mention it later that it doesn't, uh, it, it, it doesn't limit you only by NLP tasks, but we have way, way more functionality in it. But first, let me start with a few words about what is H2 Hydrogen Torch, what are the goals, how does it work, um, and what can you expect from that? First of all, uh, it is a tool for you to apply deep learning uh, on your data. So it will help you unlock the value of the unstructured data from, uh, from your company or from your problem. So first of all, we're focusing on uh, unstructured data being, uh, well, being the, the best uh, field of application of deep learning. With the H2 Hydrogen Port, you will be able to build state-of-the-art deep learning models and apply deep learning this way to innovate. I want to emphasize that we're talking about the tool uh, that will uh, allow to use your own data to, uh, to apply deep learning to your problems, which, um, uh, which is another improvement over using uh, pre-trained models or uh, pre-trained and uh, exposed APIs because you can tailor the model to your particular problem at hand. Uh, so even if there is no API which can solve the problem you're struggling with currently, with H2 Hydrogen Forge, you will be still able to solve it and use state-of-the-art deep learning techniques, transfer learning, and many more, uh, many more techniques we'll talk about later today. And last but not least, um, uh, with H2 Hydrogen Torch, you don't have to, um, to share your data with any external company. This is a tool you're going to use at your own environment with your own data. And uh, you will own the data you have. You will own the model you, you get. And uh, all the data and all the process will be secured within, within your own environment. If your IT security needs uh, require that, then it is it 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 will be a great tool for you. Um, why did we develop H two Hydrogen Torch uh, in the first place? Um, I know we touched it uh, a little bit a week ago uh, during our first session, but I want to uh, go a little bit deeper here. Um, as we all know, most of the data currently generated is in, is in structured data. These are texts, these are vid videos, these are uh, images, these are audio files. So um, a lot of companies and uh, uh, small and big companies, they have large, uh, large data sets of unstructured data, which are quite difficult to work with. Uh, and there is definitely a gap uh, between the the need to analyze this data and the talent required to do so. So according to, uh, to an external research, uh, we have only limited availability of the people with skills to tackle AI problems with deep learning and basically solve the business problems uh, using the unstructured data. So H2 Hydrogen Forge is um, our uh, way to democratize deep learning. So bring the power, the power of deep learning to a way larger audience, to a broader audience. Um, we have uh, quite, a, quite a big team of uh, senior data scientists and Kaggle grandmasters behind H2 Hydrogen Forge. So these are people that have a lot of uh, applied experience in deep learning and in different applications of deep learning. But the goal of this tool is actually to nicely package this experience to uh, cut all the difficulties of, uh, in order for novice users or for uh, junior data scientists to start away, uh, start right away with using Hydrogen Torch and deliver deep learning models without the necessity to go to gain all the practical and theoretical experience, uh, gain all the details, and more importantly, to write a lot of uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow code to get things done. So uh, the goal is, of this tool is to democratize deep learning and to bring it to those companies that lack the qualified resources just to start deep learning, deep learning projects on their own. 
Um, deep learning is a quite a large field. Uh, today, uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're going to be focusing on NLP, but I want to emphasize that uh, as of today, Hydrogen Torch supports, supports way more than just textual data and NLP tasks. We already have support of images and video, so computer vision tasks and audio tasks as well. Um, as um, for those who used driverless AI or uh, some um, uh, ASCII learn uh, tools to uh, to create um, to create machine learning models, uh, we usually know that these are typical classification and regression tasks. So depending on the type of the predictions we want to make, do if we want to predict a number or a category, we're just talking in terms of either two, either classification or regression or just two types of the tasks. But in case of uh, deep learning and unstructured data, it gets quite complicated. So depending on what we have as the input and depending on what we have as the output, there are uh, quite a lot of different tasks out there, different problem types as they call them. So classification and regression is usually just the beginning. Uh, the more complicated it gets, uh, the more um, the more specific problem type you might need to solve your own problem. Uh, to, so to solve your problem, it has to be uh, text data based or computer vision based. And uh, we cover quite a large variety of the, these problem types. Uh, today, we'll, we'll go through the problem types we have for text. So uh, we'll start with the regression and classification use cases, but we'll also talk about uh, talking classification, span prediction, sequence to sequence, and metric learning. Um, but yeah, but I'm, I'm gonna, uh, in the end, I'm gonna mention uh, that uh, we have also quite a variety of computer vision use cases uh, available for you in Hydrogen Torch. So what, what makes Hydrogen Torch special? And what are the key differences from other tools out there? First of all, it's a no code framework. As I mentioned in the beginning, we tried to design this tool uh, to become a um, uh, to become um, a tool for junior data scientists right away. So, for those who don't have much experience in deep learning, that can be a tool uh, to get their uh, to get the deep learning models delivered quite quickly, and uh, which is I think equally important to learn on the way. Uh, to learn while doing so. So uh, even though you can start with a quick, um, quick training of a deep learning model of your task, you can still uh, learn by doing and following our documentations, tutorials, and get guidelines. Uh, learn more about deep learning techniques, learn more about NLP, uh, and uh, get a better uh, get better in deep learning overall as an area. And, uh, get better in applied deep learning using H2 Hydrogen Torch. That will allow you to tune your model better to your needs, uh, be that accuracy or maybe efficiency of the model and get a better fit model uh, for your business use case. We, we cover quite a lot of problem types, as I mentioned, but uh, I want to emphasize that it's not an exhaustive list. Uh, it's just, it's gonna grow uh, quarter over quarter. So uh, during the last release, we added support of audio classification and regression, but definitely we're not gonna stop there. Best practices. Uh, Kaggle Grandmasters stand behind the tool, not only with attempt to simplify it and make it available for all, um, all levels of the data science expertise, but uh, they also stand behind all the functionality uh, currently there and that will appear there by means of um, competing on Kaggle and uh, following the research and trying out these research in competitive environment. This way we make sure that the best uh, applied techniques uh, out there are implemented in Hydrogen Torch. And every quarter uh, with every new release, we try to add more uh, new and um, more efficient things uh, to Hydrogen Torch and improve the existing ones. Model tuning, uh, you're, you will be able to tune the, exist, uh, the models you fit there. So not only you will be able just to get a quick win by uh, running the default model and get a, a very good performance, but you can also maximize the performance by tuning 
routines we have there. I will show you them later today. And if, uh, if getting the maximum accuracy is the goal for you, then you will be able to achieve it. Uh, last but not least, the deployment. We, uh, we took care of that. So all the models that you did develop in Hydrogen Torch, you will be able to deploy either with an H2O AI platform directly to our MLOps tool, or you can package it and transfer it to the deployment environment of your choice. For junior data scientists, uh, we provide the no-code tool. So you can start right away uh, and gain some experience, master a little bit of uh, deep learning uh, theory and practice using the tool. Or even if you're not a data scientist at all, you can try to fill a junior, a junior data scientist shoes and uh, learn a little bit uh, and try to fit a, a deep learning model with it. But even if you're an experienced deep learning engineer, you will find all the variety of the techniques which we implemented and exposed through UI. So you will be able to get the best performance of the model using Hydrogen Torch. Um, let's now switch from the slides to the live demo. So we'd like to go through uh, some exa few examples of how Hydrogen Torch looks, works, and what are the models um, you can build with, uh, with it, and how would you work with the models, how would you analyze the models, and um, other functionality that we provide in H2 Hydrogen Torch. So um, here I'm running um, an instance uh, on the cloud, H2 Hydrogen Torch version 1.1. Uh, we're using H2 Wave as the technology to build the UI. So those who are using H2 tools uh, might be very familiar with that by now, and it might be easy for you to, uh, to navigate through the UI. Uh, the workflow of uh, H2 Hydrogen Torch is very straightforward, uh, as, as is with the driverless AI. Uh, you usually import the data set, you create an experiment, and then you inspect the results, uh, pick the model you would like to use in the production, and you deploy that. Um, we also ship a, a publicly available documentation of Hydrogen Torch. Uh, which I'm going to emphasize a few times today because uh, we have it uh, we have it very detailed with uh, with videos overviewing the product with tutorials for the beginners to explain all the details how models uh, how data sets are uploaded how, how models are trained how to interpret all the parameters what do they mean how how to work with the tool how to interpret the results how to export and deploy the models. So everything I'm going to talk about and way uh, much, much more is described in the documentation in a, in a very user-friendly format. Um, now let's jump into examples. I'm showing you an instance where we have uh, several demo data sets uh, uploaded into Hydrogen Torch and some, uh, several demo experiments which we have uh, pre-ran for you to explore how the experiments look like, how the outputs look like, and what is the expected result of running an experiment. Uh, so you can browse, browse through that uh, to see the examples before you start working with it. But before I go through a few examples we have, let's just go, let's just jump in and start an experiment. Here we have um, an example data set. Uh, it's a public data set with a set of texts, short texts, um, which are queries, uh, basically people asking questions, and uh, a rating manually assigned to these queries to, uh, to estimate how well they're formed. Uh, why, is this, uh, why is this a task? Uh, it is because that uh, frequently when you're working uh, on NLP tasks related to query management, you want to figure out which are uh, properly uh, shape queries uh, uh, properly uh, in in um, in the means of grammar, in the means of stating uh, uh, a question properly, and the good ones are the ones you would like to work with, and probably the bad ones is not something you would like to focus a lot. So maybe building a model to recognize how well shaped the question is might actually help you clean the data, or maybe improve the use case you're working on it. 
Uh, but for now, um, in this example, we're just going to be using it as a demo uh, where we were, uh, we're, where we're going to build a um, deep learning model, which tries to predict how well the, this question is shaped based on this data set. So the input is going to be the text column and the output is going to be this rating, which is uh, defined uh, in the range between zero and one. So here we have a couple of pairs of the, of the examples. Um, uh, they're quite straightforward. So let's just jump into an experiment creation. So I click create an exper create experiment. And first thing I want to start with is, is the experience, experience level at the very top. As we've uh, talked about before, um, uh, the tool is designed to a range of experience levels from novice to master. So let's, uh, let's assume I'm a novice. So I'd like to uh, actually get uh, as simple experience as possible uh, training a new deep learning model for my task for well-formed queries. So this task is called text regression. So based on the text, on a text, we're trying to predict a numerical value. Um, I, um, I specify the experiment name. I have a a generated name here I'm happy with. Um, I have a training data frame, the one I pre-uploaded to, uh, to the tool. We need uh, some validation strategy. Uh, typically, it's just a k-fold cross-validation, and um, I can pick any folds. I pick the default one. I'm fine with that. I don't have a test data frame. Uh, I only have a training data frame, so I'm not going to use this uh, functionality to measure um, the performance on the model on a separate data set for now. I want to predict the rating and I want to use the text column. So all the default settings are, are fine. And as a novice, I'm actually exposed um, to three hyperparameters I want to pick from. The bottom one is the metric. What would be the assessment of the accuracy of the model? Mean absolute error. I'm happy with that. Let's, let's keep the default one. Number of epochs, how long do I want to train the model for? Default is two, but I have a model which has uh, which I ran before, which uh, ran for two epochs. Let's increase it to four and see what happens. And the backbone. Um, all of the NLP tasks uh, usually require uh, a pre-trained model. Uh, so a model which was uh, our uh, which was trained on a large corpus of uh, texts. Uh, uh, some of the basic ones are used on the entire Wikipedia, but some are more specific. They might be trained on some financial data. Uh, some of them are trained on medical data. Some of these models are larger and smaller. Here we provide um, a relatively short list of the pre-selected backbones for you to choose from. But uh, this field is actually free text field. And if you look at the documentation or a hint over here, you can actually go to uh, the Hugging Face library that contains thousands of models there and pick the one you need for your particular use case. Uh, it might be language specific, it might be domain specific, it might be a specific size of the model. So you might want to go for a very large model or a very small model. You can just uh, use a free text over here to type the name here, uh, here and h 2 hydrogen Torch will download the model for you and start training a model with the backbone of your choice, which can go far beyond just this list of, I've mentioned. So um, at the moment, I'm happy with the default backbone choice. So it's going to be BERT, uh, uh, base BERT model, uncased. Um, I'm fine with that. Let's just start an experiment. And I'm starting it. It's, in the, it's cute. It's here, uh, and it's going to take a couple of minutes to, to run and finish. While it's running, it's going to take around 10 minutes. Uh, let me open um, an experiment which I've already run for this data set for text regression, just to show you how, how, uh, how it looks like when, we've, uh, when one is already done. When I go to a finished ex experiment, first thing I will see is the chart of how, the prog uh, how it progressed over time. This one ran for just two epochs, so we have two records of the validation loss and validation mean absolute error metric. And we have a more detailed uh, graph of how 
uh, training process developed uh, over time with training batch losses, training learning rates. Uh, the other experiments we're, experiment we're running now uh, is tracking it live. Here we have a static picture after uh, an experiment has been finished. We have metrics over here. So even though we're focusing on mean absolute error, uh, we still can check all the, all the typical metrics, so root mean squared error, R squared, and so forth. Uh, we have a config over here, which might be also interesting, which contains all of the parameters uh, we've set. Uh, we actually set only three, but there are lots of technical ones, and there are lots of parameters which are hidden for novice user. So later uh, today, I will, uh, I will open the master uh, level, uh, experience level, and I will show you all the parameters we have there exposed, which is quite a long list, as you can see here. And after the experiment finished, besides looking at uh, the progress, uh, at whether the model converged and at the absolute values of the metric we're aiming at, um, we're also showing some predictions insights. So that shows how the model worked on particular examples. Here we have three sections, random examples, best examples, and worst examples. Let's... Um, Let's pick a random one. Is Kathy Perry is Katy Perry married? Well, that looks like a well-shaped one, and it was assessed as 0.8, relatively high, and we predicted 0.86. So we were 0.06. Uh, uh, that's the value of loss. This they were we were that far from the, the actual label. So yeah, it looks reasonable. Um, and if we look at uh, a few other examples, um, usually, it, um, usually it gives you a flavor of how the model works and if, if it can capture these examples well enough. Uh, we can look at the best examples. They're typically perfect, but most interesting is looking at those examples which were the most challenging for a model. And um, um, as, we, as we see here, these are very typically it very frequently happens that you find a specific subset of the data which model fails to, uh, to work on well, or uh, you might actually question the labels themselves. Uh, so is there any plants in a cave? Um, well, it's, it's scored zero, but we predict it as a proper question. That's a question actually to the labeling at the moment. So I'm not exactly sure that the label is correct. And maybe um, I'm just assuming that here, uh, the model might be actually working better than the manual uh, annotation we, we've done for the sample. So this is, uh, this is an example of a finished model. After we finish it, uh, we can um, do the, uh, all the expected actions with the model, starting with predicting it on, an, on a new data set. Uh, we can download some logs and uh, technical information. We can download the predictions, uh, the out of fault predictions on the training data set the model did. So for instance, if you want to do uh, some external analysis of the results of the model performance, or you want to supply the predictions of the model to some optimization routine or push it to an external tool, you can just download it from here and use, uh, use it um, the way you need it. And uh, two more options we provide over here to uh, deploy the model. One is using uh, the package for H2 ML Ops. So you will be able to, to deploy it directly to an H2 tool, which will expose this model as a REST API. So you'll be able to send uh, REST API calls to this model from uh, any tool you want uh, to consume this, this model. Or um, we provide even more flexible option over here to download it as a scoring pipeline, uh, which will give you a will package with all the dependencies uh, installed in, in it. Meaning that in order to run this model, you will just need, uh, you will just need um, a Python environment uh, on any sort of machine, a virtual machine or any, or any deployment service you want to run. So uh, with this option, you're pretty much uh, able to deploy it on any virtual machine out there. Uh, you just need to install a, uh, an operating system and Python there. Uh, let's uh, look at the experiment we're running. It's halfway through. So it ran through two, uh, 
two epochs already. If I refresh it, we'll see that it's changing live. So it's, it's gonna progress for two more epochs. Um, the, the thing I want to emphasize here is that uh, we can uh, observe the metric as well as uh, prediction insights live. So for the model, which we achieved after the two epochs, we already have some predictions, some uh, insights over here. So even though, uh, even though it's still in progress, we can figure out certain things about the model on the way and either stop the experiment, change the settings, or, uh, change a specific setting we're not happy with, um, or just uh, make sure that the progress is uh, reasonable and we just need to wait for this experiment to finish to get a model which we would like to deploy. Uh, this was an example of a text regression task, but uh, as I mentioned, we have um, we have a few more for, for NLP use cases. Uh, another classic example is text classification. Here we have um, a, data, a demo data set of Amazon reviews where we are trying to classify if a review was, uh, if a review of a product was positive or not. So it's a simple binary classification. We have a model which we ran also for two epochs with uh, an outlook of uh, 098. So let me be more accurate over here. So the outlook is 09859, so very high. The model is performing very well. And here for the metrics, we, we, uh, we see um, specific uh, metrics for binary classification. So uh, even though the target was rock outlook, we have all the accuracy, precision, recall, uh, F1, F2 score, and a confusion matrix at the bottom. So you can play around uh, to see what are the true or the false positive, false negatives, and check what how the matrix and the confusion matrix changes uh, if we change the threshold of how we classify the predicted reviews into positive and negative. And same, um, and the, um, it also stands uh, for predictions insights. So we can go here to see some of random examples and make sure that the model works as expected. Uh, here we see quite probably simple examples. Uh, if a review starts with wonderful, probably it's a, it's a positive one, which is the case and we predict it well. Uh, we can check some worst examples, some of more challenging ones. Uh, uh, for instance, over here, excellent recipes. Um, it's a little bit confusing because if you go through this uh, review, it looks like a positive one, but it was la labeled negative. Um, and vice versa for the next one, something is not going to work, but it's it was labeled positive, even though the model predicted, predicted this negative. So this all points in the direction that actually the model works better than true labels are. And all these examples we're looking for, uh, we're looking at at the moment, they seem to be just purely mislabeled. So the actual accuracy of this model might be uh, higher than we even report. And all this uh, examples where the predicted probability is far away from the true label uh, might be the data points we would like to either reconsider or drop uh, completely from the data. Um, let's move on to some more complicated uh, problem types we have here in Hydrogen Torch. Uh, we talked about text regression, text classification. Uh, let's now look at text talking classification. Um, this is a task where uh, we expect to predict um, tokens, words or phrases and classify them into categories. A very typical example over here, uh, where the categories are names, uh, names of uh, organizations, or some other uh, specific names uh, of products, uh, locations, and so forth. So what we're given uh, to train for this task uh, is short text where we, uh, where someone pre-labeled uh, some of the words into these categories. So France hence suspect ETA member to Spain. Uh, France is a location, Spain is a location, and ETA is an organization name. And we build a model that would uh, that would correctly classify 
um, each word into these categories. Here we have uh, random examples, but all of them are quite perfect. Uh, let's have a look at the worst ones. So these are more complicated texts where we make some mistakes, but we still see that uh, they are not that terrible. So commission regulation. Uh, so this is a specific uh, class we would like the model to predict. Uh, we see that the predictable label is correct only for commission, but not regulation. regulation. So there are a couple of errors over here. Um, uh, EC is correctly classified as an organization and so forth. So with this task, we're not predicting just a single output, but we're actually predicting uh, a sequence of outputs of uh, multiple potential classes. We want to classify our words or tokens from the text. Um, that's, that's a simple example where uh, we look at like uh, named entity recognition pretty much, uh, but this uh, problem type has, large, uh, has wider applications. So depending on the use case, you might want to recognize certain um, names from uh, say insurance claims document where you want to check uh, specific names of people, names of doctors, maybe names of uh, drugs uh, in uh, medical claims examples and you might want to extract the names of the of the drug of the drugs um, from the claim to match it for instance to the insurance policy to see if the, these drugs are covered by the insurance policy to automate this process so that might be a, kind of a basis of a use case of automatically repaying uh, automatically repaying uh, health insurance claims uh, when you have a good match between drugs names and the documents and drug names in the, uh, in the insurance policy. Uh, here we have a couple of specific metrics uh, for, for such a task. Micro F1 score is quite high, 0935. And we saw based on the random examples that usually the model performs quite well. And as we saw in, uh, in the previous example with the classification, sometimes the model perform, uh, the models can perform uh, very close to the performance of a human uh, labeling such, uh, such texts. Moving on to the next problem type, let's look at the metric text metric learning. At this task, oh, we're given a set of uh, texts, and some of them are actually uh, duplicates. And we want to teach a deep learning model to recognize duplicated texts, not in terms of the contents, but rather in terms of the meaning. Um, we're using a data set from, uh, I think, Ubuntu qu uh, questions, Ubuntu related questions uh, from, from a forum in order to find duplicated questions uh, and well, remove the duplicates or give the, the answer which was given to the question uh, asked before. Uh, and what the model is supposed to do is it is supposed to recognize that this exact question in terms of its meaning and content, uh, uh, content was asked before, is there in the database. And here we have for each uh, random example, uh, to assess the performance of the model, we have top three other questions from the data set according to the model predictions. Uh, so these are the top three assessed by the model questions uh, similar to the original one. So the original one, is there an easy way to limit user bandwidth usage? The top one is, can we create bandwidth limit for all users? Looks quite good. Uh, the expected similarity is 079, which is quite high. Hi, and it is a match. So according to our manually, label, um, manually labeled pairs, this is, a, this is a duplicate, which is true as we see that. And we can look at a few more examples. For instance, uh, um, something related to Windows 7. And here we have a uh, worse match uh, over here. So the, the closest uh, question based on our model assessment is this one, but with a lower estimate and it's a no match. So here we can see that uh, we can potentially even set a, a specific threshold to claim when a question is a duplicate or it is not a duplicate. That can help us well, clean up the, the duplicated questions, but also uh, can have quite a broad uh, range of applications uh, 
uh, including uh, maybe some FAQ sections on your website, for instance. So if someone asks a question, you want to find a similar one from FAQ and give, uh, give a reply to that. Um, for platforms like Quora, that might be exactly finding duplicated questions and just removing them or pointing the author uh, to the question, which looks uh, very similar to one the author is asking. Uh, now let's go to some uh, even more complicated, uh, to my opinion, examples. Uh, first one would be, uh, second to last, sorry, second to last one would be sequence to sequence. Uh, that's a problem, an NLP problem type where we have uh, a text as an input and a text as an output. Uh, a very typical way of apply it is to specify a task of text summarization. So in this example, we have a set of CNN articles describing something. Uh, you can see these are long articles, well, quite long ones, um, but we want to, um, to get a summary of those in just a few sentences. So we have a pre-labeled data set where for each article, we just have a couple of sentences summarizing the, the contents of that. And the model is trained to actually do exactly that. So the model consumes an, uh, a text and generates a new text, which is expected to uh, have all the contents of the article summarized in it. So we see that it's kind of uh, shrinking the, the size and according to, to the metrics, it, it, it works quite well. Uh, and if you read the, the summaries, they're quite, quite meaningful. We're not going to go through through our through the articles. They're quite large over here, but I want to emphasize um, that this um, this particular application of NLP with H2 hydrogen torch uh, is quite impressive in terms of the fact that the model will generate the text. It not only looks uh, as a human reading text, but it also captures the contents of of a larger article. Um, there are quite a lot of applications you can think of how of how you would apply such models starting from um, extracting summaries from the text. Uh, um, for instance, if you need to have them summarized in some um, short form for say better search or to uh, provide a description of certain things to, uh, to the management or something like that, or maybe to simplify some more uh, domain specific text for non-expert that, that can also be an interesting application. And before we finish, I want to show you one more problem type we have, which is uh, text span prediction. Uh, and a very, very typical use case of that, uh, and I think typically this problem type is actually named after it, it's question answering. So in this use case, we actually have two textual inputs, a question and the content, uh, the context, sorry. And we expect the model to find the answer to this question in the context. Uh, so let's, um, for instance, over here. Okay, that's yeah. Still a uh, still a very uh, still a perfect answer. Uh, but let's see how it works. What shortages were caused by the blockade? And we have a description about a certain historical event. And the proper answer is petrol and food. And the predicted answers in order of um, confidence are petrol and food, which is exactly perfect, petrol and food shortages, and petrol and food shortages because, and even the explanation extracted from the text after that. So the model is able to recognize and to consume the meaning of the question to analyze the, the, the context, find the proper answer. And um, uh, typically when you see uh, non-perfect answers, these are, let's, let me jump to that and show you a couple of examples with worst examples, with the worst samples. Uh, for instance, uh, prior to what year um, were the reports used to assess sea level rise? The correct answer is pre-1993, but actually the model picked just 1993. Or sometimes the model just takes a little bit of a, of a, a longer output uh, as, as the proper label. So 
Uh, it is a very impressive use case to see how uh, well NLP uh, deep learning models can understand the text uh, and even answer the questions. There's also quite a variety of the applications of how you can use such a model, starting from a basic question answering tailored to your uh, content. Uh, say if you have a website and you have uh, kind of a Q&A interaction with users, you might use uh, that. But you can also uh, find applications such as extracting certain information from a set of the texts. Uh, I've already mentioned examples of uh, insurance claims. Uh, so if you have insurance claims um, of a particular type and uh, they come with, uh, uh, with some documents with them, uh, which are hard to analyze with typical methods, with classical statistical methods, you might want to kind of curate by asking questions. And well, depending on the question, you will get uh, different uh, pieces of the text if they're there, and uh, that will allow you to, well, analyze your uh, unstructured data of uh, insurance claims, and maybe even extract some features for further modeling, say, if you're running an actuary model, uh, you're probably not using the, the full uh, textual data from the claims, but you can extract certain, um, certain important pieces by means of applying question answering model to these texts. Um, before we finish the live demo part, let me um, show you what is the interface for, uh, for a more experienced data scientist using Hydrogen Torch. So um, we have this experiment finished. Uh, we, we started in the beginning. Uh, we see there was a little bit of a irregularity with the validation uh, metric, but it dropped. If we go back, we actually can see that um, it is even better, even more accurate than the, the one we ran before. So the demo, uh, the demo experiment had two, um, ran for two epochs, we ran one for five epochs and it got a lower validation metric. If we want to run another experiment, we can start it from the one, uh, from the one that has been already finished. So here um, I'm starting a new experiment from the previous one. So it has four epochs as I specified. Sorry, I think I said five. Um, and if, uh, if I gained a little bit of experience and confidence, I can go to a um, uh, higher experience level. Let me open the last one, master. And this one exposes all the hyperparameters available in Hydrogen Torch for you to tune. And um, just as a side note, uh, the parameters are dependent on the problem type, of course. So for different NLP uh, use cases, they, they might be a little bit different, but if you open say computer vision, it's gonna be quite different sub, uh, quite different set of hyperparameters. So let's go uh, and check what are you able to tune if you are an experienced uh, deep learning data scientist, uh, or if you want to get the most accuracy for your NLP use case. Um, I'm gonna skip some of the smaller ones, uh, some of the more complex ones, uh, but the, uh, let's, let's just go through the, uh, through the major ones in more details. First is a lowercase, so whether we lowercase text or not, max length. As we know, BERT models, they use only uh, um, a subsequence of the text of a, of a limited number of tokens. Um, by default, we set it to 128, but you can increase it, decrease it, de depending on the size of your data, depending on the size of your model, and depending on the size of your GPU, you can actually play with this parameter and get kind of a larger, uh, longer text, uh, or if you don't need it, uh, like in the, some cases I showed where the text are small, this is actually not important. Uh, uh, some more uh, experience, some more enhanced uh, settings like gradient checkpointing or setting an intermediate dropout, which you can do by default, the model doesn't have it. Uh, you can choose a pooling uh, approaches. Um, by default, we, we use the classification token of the BERT model, but you can use, um, you can apply pooling, which will change the structure of the model a little bit. Uh, the loss function, uh, you can specify the metric, but also we have a, a variety of loss functions to opt for the um, uh, gradient descent method to optimize. 
Uh, of course, we have a bunch of optimizers over here with learning rate and learning rate scheduling. We saw that uh, by default it's a cosine scheduler, but you can play around and we have a bunch of those. Uh, warm up, uh, weight decay and so forth. Gradient clipping. So when gradients grow too large, uh, that might happen in certain cases uh, of a certain data types, especially when labels are extremely um, skewed. Gradient accumula accumulation, when you want to average gradients across multiple multiple batches. Um, evaluation epoch, so you can, uh, if the model takes quite a long time uh, because if the model is large or the data set is large, you can have um, it evaluated more less frequently than every epoch and so forth. Uh, one more thing I want to emphasize is multi-GPU support built-in. Um, on this machine, I have only single GPU, but I can use as many GPUs as there are attached to the machine. And, um, and Hydrogen Forge will use all of them to train the model. So it will distribute the data across the GPUs and do, uh, run the synchronization. So the, actually the training speed will be close to linear. So if you have four GPUs, then basically you can use all four to fit a single model and it will be running almost four times faster. Or you can use one GPU and the, the other three to solve another problem at the same time. All the experiments will be running in parallel and consuming independent GPUs uh, and therefore won't uh, interfere. Last but not least, if you're not sure, for instance, what is the backbone for you and you have a couple of choices, uh, you would like to consider, you can run a grid search over here. So I switch it on and now uh, for most of the parameters, I can choose multiple values, be it backbone, uh, be it say pooling approach. Um, and when I click run experiment, basically a grid search will be started. So hydrogen torch will trigger multiple experiments for me. And after I'm back from my coffee, I will just compare them and pick the best one for, for the production use. Um, and jumping back to the documentation, everything I described and way, way more details you can find in the documentation. So if we go to the experiment and experiment settings uh, for text regression, the one I sh was showing before, here every single setting is described with uh, with explanation of how it affects the performance of the model. So uh, that's the way for you to learn more about uh, particular settings and values of these settings and get better uh, as a deep learning data scientist. Now let me jump back to the slides. And here now we have a second quick poll for you. Let me hand it over back to Blair. All right, so we're gonna do another poll here. How relevant is natural language processing to your day to day? Give everyone a few seconds to get some answers in. So far, it looks like we have a little bit of a divide. All right, looks like most people are coming in. All right, so it looks like a little bit of a divide between all sides of using NLP models all the way to not using them. I see, but we have quite quite some uh, quite a few people that have a need for NLP, but there is a struggle of either building or uh, delivering them to production. So basically, uh, uh, H2 Hydrogen Torch might be a very good fit for you exactly for these two purposes. So what we have it designed for is to help you build the models uh, on your data in your environment and to deploy it uh, either to your environment, environment again or to H2 ML Ops. So you won't have the struggle of maintaining the, uh, the DevOps tool uh, and you'll just have a a REST API almost right away. Um, before we finish, let me give you a 
quick uh, recap of what we've discussed today. Let, let's just quickly go through the class, uh, to, sorry, through the NLP problem types we, we've covered today. Uh, and uh, here I want to emphasize that uh, the use cases I've, sh I've, showed, I've shown today is just, are just examples. So these are examples of how you can apply exactly this problem type, but uh, there are um, amazing amount of potential use cases you can solve by just applying the same techniques to a different uh, data set at hand. Um, a few more points as well. For classification, uh, we support multi-label data sets. So uh, if you have multiple labels you want to predict at the same time, we're looking at a single one. It was uh, whether the review is positive or not, but you can have multiple targets at the same time, which we uh, support out of, the, out of the box. For all NLP models, it stands that multilingual and uh, the main specific support is there because we support uh, almost all hugging face models. Uh, uh, you can get them by just typing in the name into the uh, backbone field. And that would allow you to use language specific models. So if you have some texts in Spanish and German or even a mixture. So if you have a mixture of Spanish and English documents, you can download and use a multilingual model which will treat both Spanish and English text uh, equally, and the main specific. There are lots of the main specific pre-trained models out there. Um, so the models which were not trained on general text like Wikipedia, but rather financial documents or medical documents, and using these backbones can actually give you um, a significant boost in model accuracy if your problem is very domain specific. Uh, for talking classification, uh, other examples uh, from, uh, from uh, what we've, we've seen today might be uh, extracting uh, names of the drugs uh, or extracting personal information from the documents. So if you want to anonymize a document uh, in order to share with a third party, for instance, you might want to extract all the names, locations, social security numbers, emails, and so forth. So you can set it up as a token classification task with custom entities, those which you uh, find in your documents and you want to find and either use or remove. Um, and for uh, either insurance use cases or anonymization use cases, this, this uh, such models can work quite well. Uh, span predictions uh, or um, a typical use case of um, building the question answering system. Uh, another example would be finding relevant information in medical transcripts, finding relevant information in uh, insurance claims, as I mentioned, and whatever your uh, current problem is, uh, it might be, span prediction can be, uh, might be applicable to that. Sequence to sequence, uh, allowing, uh, that, that allows the model to generate new text. Uh, we had an example of summarization uh, we talked about simplification as another example, but definitely there are way more applications out there than only that. Metric learning, uh, we talked about finding duplicate, duplicated questions for FAQ. Another example is detecting fake reviews, uh, for instance, on, on websites with movie reviews or book reviews. Uh, you might have like a spike of... Uh, negative or positive reviews out, no, out of nowhere. So you might even detect these spikes as uh, groups of fake, one, fake ones by running such a model and uh, while well, clustering all, uh, all, all of them together and just removing them basically. And the last slide, slide for me uh, for today is just uh, a reminder that NLP is just uh, one piece of uh, functionality that H2 Hydrogen Torch provides. Uh, we have a lot of use cases for images and video data. We have use cases for audio using uh, spectrograms. Um, as, and also these are more complicated examples than just classification and regression. We also have metric learning for images when you want to find duplicated images uh, if on your website if you're selling items. Uh, here at the bottom we have examples of the same bicycle with four different pictures, uh, but the model was able to recognize it. 
Uh, we have examples that extract, uh, detect objects on images, obviously, but also uh, do instant segmentation. So segment images and finding, for instance, uh, piece, uh, some clothes, specific types of the clothes for, um, for some applications uh, for retailers or cars or anything else. Um, and last but not least, we're adding a support for, for explainability for our deep learning models. Here we, you see an example of grab cam applications for uh, images where we show what areas of the image drove the predictions uh, the model uh, did for this example. Um, let me uh, switch to the questions I have. I think we have a couple of those, but before that, thank you very much for, for the attention.